Welcome to ANN Weekly, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks for joining us this week. Coming up, a pastor mentoring at-risk young people in the Cayman Islands. And we'll learn why some Adventist doctors are giving kids bicycles instead of booster shots. And later, our segment where we chat with a missionary. But first, this week's Adventist news. Owning a Bible is out of reach for most young people in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. A Bible can cost as much as week's wages for subsistence farmers in the Pacific Islands. Adventist Youth Ministries leaders in the South Pacific are determined to change that. They're pledged to equip young people in the region with the tools they need to share their faith. The most of the Pacific Islanders, like the Solomon Islands, it's very hard for them to get a Bible or even to read a Bible. Eh? I'm a youth leader see young people coming to church without Bible. Only a few of them have Bibles. It's a big problem for our young people today. Most of our young people, they don't have the access to, to a Bible. They can't even afford to buy one. The World Changers Bible Project aims to put 200,000 Bibles and discipleship kits in the hands of young people in the South Pacific. Mission offerings from recent family camps across Australia and New Zealand helped fund the project. Already, church members in the South Pacific have raised enough money to buy 19,000 Bibles. Church Youth Ministries Director for the South Pacific, Nick Cross, says he felt convicted to empower young people to share the Adventist hope with their friends. To learn more, visit worldchanger.me. Commission ministers will not be able to serve as conference presidents, according to a decision reached last week by Adventist church leaders. After hours of debate, they turned down a request that was almost unanimously approved by church leaders in North America last year. The margin was decisive but not overwhelming at 167 to 117. This means that only formally ordained Adventist pastors can oversee the church's conferences or local administrative bodies. Church leadership in North America and Europe said approval would have spurred church growth and opened top leadership positions to more administrators, including women. Those who spoke against the request cited church unity and the Adventist tradition of hiring only ordained spiritual leaders to fill positions such as conference president. You can read many of the points church leaders made at news.adventist.org. Indianapolis will host the World Church's 2020 General Conference session. That's what top church leaders voted last week after hearing bids from various cities. Indianapolis is the capital of the U.S. state of Indiana. It was also the site of the General Conference session in 1990. The General Conference session is a global spiritual gathering and business meeting of the Adventist World Church. It is held every five years and typically draws 70,000 people during peak weekend meetings. Session is often held in North America because few other locations offer the necessary hosting requirements. Session planners look for cities with an indoor venue and a convention center within walking distance. They also consider nearby hotels and airports. The church's next general conference session is set for the U.S. city of San Antonio, Texas in 2015. Underprivileged kids in the U.S. state of Florida are riding shiny new bicycles, thanks in part to doctors from an Adventist hospital. Church-run Florida Hospital and 40 other community partners pledged in June to help provide education, health care, housing, and other basic needs for residents of nearby Bithlo, Florida. Bicycles, helmets, and running shoes for low-income students of the city's Orange County Academy are their latest effort. The often overlooked community of more than 8,000 wrestles with a cycle of poverty. Florida Hospital and community partners hope to reverse that trend. Dr. Adamola Adewale says the Florida emergency physicians jumped at the chance to help students of the Central Florida community. Adventist pastors in the Cayman Islands are trading their suits for jeans. They're hitting the streets to mentor young people in the community who are most vulnerable to drug abuse and gang involvement. The pastors say that sports, social programs, and counseling services are giving at-risk youth the respect and validation they need. The Caribbean nation has seen a sharp rise in violent crime this year. Without safe alternatives, 
and positive influences, many young people are drawn to a life of crime. They are baited by the sense of belonging and quick money that gangs promise. Recently, the church in the Cayman Islands took this mentorship program a step further. Pastors are now offering counseling and prayer to the entire community. The church uh, decided uh, that it had to do something, and so what we've decided to do is to organize ourselves and, uh, and to plan community um, public rally, prayer rallies. And so we have initiated that, and we started in the area where most of the criminal activities um, were taking place and launch a major um, prayer rallies on, on, on Thursday night. We saw a number of community members who came out, a huge number of community members came out, leaders, civic leaders who came out, pastors from other denominations were invited, and we prayed for the community. We prayed for the perpetrators of the violence and their family members. We prayed for the family members of the victims. We prayed for the political leadership. We prayed for the police department. So we had four or five different prayers. We sang hymns and um, it was quite, quite refreshing. The community members were very, very um, supportive and very, very grateful that we were able to do that. We moved from that area in West Bay of the, of the western section of the island called West Bay into the capital city of Georgetown, had another major rally. At that particular rally, we had the premier who came in, in attendance and gave a speech. We have members of his cabinet who came in attendance. Um, so that was very, very impacting because we were able to impact the, the entire nation. And as a result of that, a number of community members also came out. And what was particularly interesting is that our president um, gave the address at each of the, uh, each of the um, rallies and really encouraged the members to share their burdens with us. If they have information that they'd like to talk with us, um, if they're scared of talking to the police, um, they, they could find some conf confidence in us, and, and, and they did. Individuals came in and they shared information with us, relevant information concerning what was going on in the community. And we were happy to counsel with them and to help them and to pass it on to the authorities so that we were part of the crime-solving initiative in the Cayman Islands. Welcome back. Here's Adventist Review Associate Editor Walona Karimabadi with a preview of the next issue of the church's flagship magazine. If you've ever had questions about the doctrine of the sanctuary, this week's edition of the Adventist Review is for you. It's a little bit unique in that we have two cover features making up a package. The first article is by Sean Brace, and it's about examining the doctrine of the sanctuary from the context of appreciating our great high priest and what he is doing for us and how he has felt the things that we've felt and understands what it is to be tempted. The second piece is by our associate editor, Gerald Klingbeil, who examines the sanctuary in terms of it being a big picture with several facets and, and different ways to examine it that will help you better understand this. This is a great addition to keep on hand for sharing, to keep as a reference tool if you ever have questions about it or have anybody who does. The other um, an interesting component in this week's edition is an article about gossip. This is something that is alive and well, I guess, in most facets of our life. And it's an important article written by Tabitha Abel that looks at it in a practical aspect. One, again, that would be great for sharing and for keeping around. You can read these articles online. You can also find out more about the Adventist Review by going to www.adventistreview.org. What is it like to serve as a missionary in Moscow? Tanya Holland chatted on Skype this week with an Adventist volunteer who just returned from Russia. She has this report. Hi, I'm Tanya Holland, and today on Meet a Missionary, we're going to talk to Daria, who just returned from Moscow. Daria, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good. How, I how are you? Good. I understand you're in Moscow. Can you give us... Can you tell us where you're originally from? Uh, I live in Toronto, in Canada. Very good. So while you were in Moscow, can you give us, tell us a story where you noticed God's presence in the community while you were serving there? Um, yeah, we had, actually, there was another girl in my group who's been coming to Bible studies pretty, um, because people come because it's free and English is really expensive 
to learn. So they just come with this expectation, like, oh, I'm just, you know, a freebie, like, can't really go wrong with that. Like, you know, doesn't, nonetheless, like, re- learning about God or not. So we had this girl, and she, I, I had a chance to go for tea with her to, you know, talk to her. And she was telling me that she's been coming to these Bible studies for about a year now. And at first, when she was coming, she she's like, why would, why would I need God in my life? You know, like, I, I'm just coming for the English. And then she was saying that the more she was coming, the more she realized, like, wow, this religion thing or this faith is could work for me. And, uh, you know, we prayed together and um, she brought her prayer requests to the group as well. And we prayed for her and then we would share the answers to her prayers. And, you know, she felt like her prayers were being answered. So it was just wonderful to see that somebody, you know, who at first could seem so closed to the idea of God can become, you know, open-minded to it and just really be such a big part of a group. Thank you, Daria. If you would like to become a missionary, please visit AdventistVolunteers.org. It's time to see what's happening in Adventist social media this week. Here's Megan Browner with the highlights. Last week, we asked for your ideas about reaching big cities, and you guys shared lots of great ideas with us on Twitter. Here are just a few. Leftsider suggests expanding community service, avoiding large churches, and building your church's reputation via Foursquare and Yelp. IED Media says we should offer Adventist taxi cabs free of charge for needy people, and hold free concerts and Christian entertainment in the streets on Sabbaths. Abel Marquez thinks the way to draw crowds is through art street fairs and performances. Fest Jam X wants to emphasize health through races, blood drive donations, and stop smoking programs. Harvey Alvarez says we should use cheap but powerful technologies to share the message, such as Facebook, tweets, YouTube, podcasts, etc. So, here's your homework for the week. Add your church to Yelp in Foursquare and get some community participation going. Send us a link on Twitter to show us the results. And of course, we have another hashtag for you. Last week, the General Conference Executive Committee voted down a proposal to allow commission ministers to be elected conference presidents. Tell us your reaction to that vote with the hashtag commissioned ministers. Come back next week to hear your answers. For many Adventists, tithing is as simple as putting an envelope in the offering plate on Sabbath. But for farmers in Botswana, calculating tithe on livestock can be complicated. We asked Erika Puni to explain. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is governed by 13 administrative regions around the world. These divisions, of course, covered many cultures and languages and uh, people groups. Now this may pose a challenge with regards to the receiving of tithes and offerings globally. But amazingly, uh, this practice of the returning of tithe and the giving of offerings do unite Adventists right across uh, the world. Now, I need to state, however, that as a church we affirm the cultural diversity uh, of our membership. But on the other hand, there is flexibility in the way people practice. Uh, their worship, which includes the returning of tithes and offerings. I was very privileged when visiting the country of Botswana to be introduced to uh, a church member who for many years has exercised her faithfulness in the returning of tithes and offerings through other forms, for example, through the returning of cattle from her ranch. Uh, the practice would require leaders of the church going to this farm uh, every year and they would count the increase uh, of the farm and the tenth animal uh, as, as these animals are counted uh, is the Lord's tithe. Here's a classic example of how people can practice faithfulness to God even in different cultural situations of the world. When we come back, your tech tip of the week. Welcome back. Have you ever gotten home only to realize you left an important file or document at work? 
What if you could access your projects online from anywhere? John Beckett tells us how. Today we're going to talk about Google Docs. Google Docs is free, online office software that includes word processing, spreadsheets, and presentations. Since it is online, you can use it by logging into the Google Docs website. Documents are stored online instead of on your computer. This means you can work with your documents from any internet-connected computer. If this were all you could do with Google Docs, it wouldn't be too interesting. But what most people don't realize about Google Docs is that multiple people can work on the same document at the same time. You just add the email addresses of those who should have access. This can work out to be a powerful new way to collaborate. For instance, I have a teleconference to talk about a project. The project is documented in a shared Google Docs spreadsheet, which all of us will be able to see and make changes to. When we're done, we'll have a shared vision of what should happen. This kind of sharing can work really well for ministries who rely on volunteers who are not able to meet physically together. It often works out a lot better than a forwarded email, especially for event or project planning. Google Docs also includes a complete history of the changes made to a document, which is great if you need to refer back to something that was changed. If you don't have a website that can already build online forms, you can attach a form to a Google Docs spreadsheet. Information entered on the web form is added to the spreadsheet. Just share the link from the form with whoever you need to collect information from. To learn more about Google Docs, visit docs.google.com. You've probably heard that secondhand smoke can be as dangerous as smoking itself. Dr. Peter Landless is here to tell us why even third-hand smoke poses a threat. Today we're talking about smoking and health. Smoking and health, of course that's a, a controversy. There is no such relationship. All tobacco smoking is harmful. And it's been shown that smoking seriously harms not only you, but those around you. And so we talk today a little bit about secondhand smoke. What is secondhand smoke? So secondhand smoke is the smoke exhaled by the smoker and the smoke that emanates from the tip of the cigarette, the cigar that comes out of the pipe, that then you breathe in or those around the smoker are exposed to. And so it's been shown that in the United States, 88 million people are exposed to secondhand smoke each year. It's been shown in the United Kingdom that one bartender a year, four years ago, were dying every week because of the exposure to tobacco smoke in the local pubs. And that is what brought about some stringent rules on stopping smoking in public places and helping people not to be exposed to secondhand smoke. Of course, there's third-hand smoke, the smoke that sticks to the cushions, to the curtaining, and to the bedding. And you can be exposed to that, and children are exposed to that, causing increased asthma, increased ear infections, and many other problems. So beware of being exposed to tobacco, thinking that you're safe, and not really because of second- and third-hand smoke. We asked Ivan Warden for some practical advice this week on prayer. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. America's most translated author, Ellen G. White, writes in two different places how we should pray without ceasing. And then she goes on to say that he who prays uh, and only prays will soon cease to pray. So there is a healthy tension between praying and doing. This is a true story of a lady who wanted her daughter to come to the United States but didn't have a sponsor and she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed some more. No sponsorship. And then one day a friend of hers called her on the phone and said, I have a gentleman who has agreed to sponsor your daughter. Here's his phone number. Call him right away. And she didn't call him. She prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and kept praying. And finally, her friend called us several weeks after and said, did you call a gentleman? And she said, no, I didn't. And the friend said, you are going to lose this blessing. She picked up the phone and called the sponsor. He said, I was waiting for your phone call two weeks ago. Now, had this lady continued to pray and pray and didn't act, her daughter would not have gotten the blessing. Others would not have been blessed. Her daughter did come to the United States, went to Loma Linda, graduated, with a master's and a 3.95 grade point average. Prayer and works go together. Do you have a story to share with ANN Weekly? 
We'll show you how after the break. Your home can be a center of hope and healing for your community. We asked Heather Don Small to tell us how the Women's Ministries Department is equipping women to support and encourage their neighbors. One of the initiatives of General Conference Women's Ministries over the next five years is called Homes of Hope and Healing. And we're very excited about this particular plan because it calls upon our sisters to open up their homes to become a place of hope and healing in their community. What we'd like to see happen is friends, family, neighbors be invited into our homes where we can spend time with them, whether it's in prayer or Bible study or even support groups. We have so many hurting people in our world today. How can we as Christians show God's love to them? One of the best ways is to invite them into our home, a place where God dwells, a place where they can come and find hope and healing. At the General Conference, we have created quite a number of programs and Bible study materials and other materials which can be used for the Home of Hope and Healing program. And so we're encouraging our sisters, become a person of hope and healing in your community. Show Jesus' love to those who you meet every day on the streets. Invite them into your home. On a &N Weekly, we bring you news from the world headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because we're a global church, we also want to hear from you. Sergio Gonzalez explains. Our church is made up of 17 million members spread around hundreds of countries all over the world. We realize we can't cover all of that ourselves. That's why we'd like to invite you to join iShare. iShare is a great new way for you to share church news that's happening in your part of the world. Share your stories with us by submitting video clips, photos, and audio that you've gathered firsthand. For more information about how you can contribute to ANN, visit news.avenist.org and click the green iShare button. Become an honorary ANN reporter today and you could see your news on our next episode. Now, let's turn to church historian David Trim for This Week in Adventist History. Welcome to This Week in Adventism. On October 17, 1888, the 27th General Conference session was held in Minneapolis, Minnesota. This GC session is considered to be one of the most decisive but also controversial in our history. The subject of righteousness by faith alone and the nature of Christ were subjects that brought heated discussions along with different views of the prophecies of Daniel 7 and Revelation 17. The same day in October 17, also 1888, Ola Olson was elected the eighth president of the General Conference, succeeding George Butler, who had in some eyes been discredited by his opposition to righteousness by faith. Olson was the first president to be born outside the United States. He was an American by upbringing and nationality because his parents immigrated from Norway to the U.S. when he was five. In 1873, he'd been elected president of the Wisconsin Conference and supported the formation of Scandinavian and German language schools in the Midwest. And while he was GC president, he really reinforced the global outreach of our church. And so did William A. Spicer, who died on October 17, 1952. He was secretary of the General Conference from 1903 to 1922, president from 1922 to 1930, and probably more than any other one individual than Ellen White, he was responsible for making the church truly a worldwide missionary church. We should remember him. And that's this week in Adventist history. Thanks for joining us for ANN Weekly. Tune in next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Until then, visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. God bless.